actually skip the duel with Voldemort, <clears throat> pick up with the last chapter. Well, take, take it back. It's not the last chapter. It's the second to the last chapter. I think it's the second to the last chapter. Almost the last chapter. Chapter 37, <clears throat> The Lost Prophecy. Dumbledore sends Harry back to his office and then arrives shortly thereafter, about 30 minutes later or so. And on page 823, Dumbledore tells Harry, I know how you're feeling, Harry. No, you don't. White hot anger leapt inside him. Dumbledore knew nothing about his feelings. And Phineas and I jealous pitches in and Dumbledore tells him to shut up. And page, bottom of that page, Dumbledore says, there's no shame in what you're feeling, Harry. On the contrary, the fact that you can feel pain like this is your greatest strength. Harry, my greatest strength, huh? You haven't got a clue. You don't know. What don't I know? I don't want to talk about it. Harry, suffering like this, top of 824, Suffering like this proves you are still a man. This pain is part of being human. Is that really helpful to tell Harry at that moment? I mean, that's like going up to a... It's like the book of Job. Okay, If you're familiar with the book of Job in the Old Testament, Job's life's just going along swimmingly. I mean, it's perfect. Richest man in the Middle East, multiple kids, Wife who loves him, sheep, goats, camels, the whole nine yards. And then the writer of Job says, meanwhile, back in heaven, and we see the sons of God go visit God. And one of those is Satan. And God says, notice in the book of Job, it's God who says to Satan, look at my servant Job. Kind of going bullseye. And Satan says, yeah, but Job wouldn't love you, serve you, etc., etc., if you didn't protect him. So God says, okay, you can touch his belonging, but you can't touch him personally. Whirlwind comes, wipes out everything he has. Okay? He goes back to heaven. And again, Satan says, yeah, but if you let me touch him, God says, okay, you can touch him, but you can't kill him. What happens? All of his kids are dead, and he comes down with the, I don't know, third millennium BC version of AIDS open boils and, you know, all that kind of stuff, okay? Doesn't die, though. And three friends come to Job. Describe Job's three friends, for those of you who are familiar with the book. What do they say? No, that's what his wife says. <laughs> his wife says, curse God and die, okay? What does three friends say? The same kind of things, I'm going to get off, on my soapbox for a moment. All too often Christians today say the same damn things. It's your fault. You sinned, you did something wrong, and God is judging you. Turns out not to be the case at all. Okay? Another friend comes and says, you guys shut up. You don't know what you're talking about. What finally happens in the book of Job? God does finally come down to Job. He doesn't come down to him in the form of, you know, Adonis or Apollo or something like that. He's a whirlwind. And he just starts asking Job a bunch of questions to shut Job up. Where were you, where were you when I created the world? Uh, pass. Where were you when I came up with the blizzard? Uh, pass. Where were you when? What's God's point? Who the hell do you think you are? Questioning me. Okay, kind of a good point. What's the relation here? They're both about the nature of suffering. Okay? When Dumbledore says, the very fact you can suffer, that's what shows you're human. That's kind of like, kind of like, I'm not saying it's equivalent to, but it's kind of like Job's friends. The only difference is that Dumbledore doesn't say, Harry, you're suffering this because you acted like an ass. You went and did something I told you not to do, though he didn't actually tell him not to do it. That's part of the problem. 
Dumbledore is partially at least to blame, which he's going to own up to in a moment. Okay? Notice, this pain is part of being human. Then I don't want to be human. Is pain part of being human? Oh, yeah. Anybody who says otherwise is a fool. Anybody who says life should be free of pain is an ass. Okay? And I hate to say it, but that's 90% of what our society tells us. That you should be able to go through life, what? Fat, dumb, and happy. <laughs> we have entire churches that preach prosperity and wealth gospel. That is, if Jesus loves you, what? You'll be rich. What a load of bullshit. Nowhere in the New Testament is that even implied. In fact, it's really just the opposite, isn't it? What the New Testament teaches is what happened yesterday in church in Sutherland Springs, Texas. That's to be expected. Okay? To be expected. Harry, I don't care. Yeah, he does. That's the problem. He cares too much. Goes all the way back to the first book. Stop, Draco. I've seen enough. I want out. I want it to end. I don't care anymore. How often do we want out? How often do we want it to end? Which is why, you know, suicide is the number one cause of death for teenagers. He sees the table on which this silver instrument had moved, flings it aside. Little anger on Harry's part? You do care, Dumbledore says. I don't. You do. I don't. Harry, you don't know how I feel. Does Dumbledore know how he feels? Book six, book seven. Yeah, he knows exactly how he feels. In fact, I think it would be safe to say Dumbledore knows even more of what Harry feels. Okay? Let me out. No. Let me out. No. <coughs> then I'm going to Dumbledore. Go ahead. Break it. Destroy it all. Page 825. By all means, continue destroying my possessions. I dare say I have too many. What's he mean? I dare say I have too many. How can you have too much stuff? Again, what does our society teach us? Possessions equal happiness. We are a consumerist society. It's not enough to have an iPhone 7 Plus. No, no, no. you got to go out and get an iPhone 8. Oh, no, no, no. Sorry, an iPhone 10. $1,000 for a freaking phone. Okay. And the iPhone 11 is probably going to be $1,500. How, when will a phone equal the price of a car or a house or a college education? Okay. Not until I've had my say, Dumbledore says. I don't care what you have to say. Here, Dumbledore, you will. <laughs> because you're not nearly as angry with me as you ought to be. Now, that ought to make Harry's ears go, what? What do you mean? If you are to attack me, as I know you're close to doing, I would like to have thoroughly earned it. It's my fault that Sirius died. And yet... What does Dumbledore tell Harry in book two and book three at the end? We can't take ownership or possession of what other people do. Harry says, so it's my fault at the end of book three if Voldemort comes back to power because I stopped Sirius and Lupin from killing Peter Pettigrew. Dumbledore says, nope, not your fault. Why? Peter Pettigrew still has what? Free will. Sirius had what? Free will. Did Sirius have to show up at the Ministry of Magic to save Harry? No, he didn't. Why did he? To save Harry. Did he know what he was getting into? Yes, he did. All right? So, Dumbledore says, page 826, 
Harry, I owe you an explanation. An explanation of an old man's mistakes. I see now what I have done and not done with regard, with regard to you bears all the hallmarks, hallmarks of the failings in age. In other words, Harry, sorry I'm an old fart and I should have known. Should have known what? Youth cannot know how age thinks and feels. So what does he do? Your first year, Harry. I guess 15 years ago when I saw the scar on your forehead, what it might mean. Harry, yeah, you told me this. Get to the point. Page 827. More recently, I became concerned that Voldemort might realize about this connection between you. Talking, of course, about the night when you saw Mr. Weasley Tech. Yes, Snape told me. Professor Snape, Harry. That is, even when Dumbledore thinks Harry's about to kill him. Professor, you know, manners. Yeah, him. All right? So, Dumbledore says, it's because of that connection I had to distance myself from you. Voldemort's aim, page 828, in possessing you, would not have been my destruction, it would have been yours. He hoped, when he possessed you briefly a short while ago, that I would sacrifice you in the hope of killing him. When was that a short while ago? During the duel. How did he possess him? Harry feels, you know, kind of Nagini taking control of him. And what does Harry think when Voldemort says, you know, just kill him, Dumbledore. If death is nothing, kill him, kill him now. What does Harry say there? Yeah, kill me, Dumbledore. And then it'll end. The pain will be over. And what causes Nagini to release him? Or Voldemort to release him? <coughs> I'll see Sirius again. Where? Because later on, he's going to have a talk with Luna. And Luna's going to say, well, it's not like you'll ever see him again. And he's like, what? <laughs> really? What are you talking about? So when he thinks earlier, he's going to see Sirius again. Where is he thinking he's going to see him? What is Harry's understanding or belief of the afterlife? Which usually falls under religion, right? What is Harry's religious training? Probably <coughs> Probably Anglican like the Dursleys. How do you know? They're kind of the proper and stereotypical English rules, and they would have. But is them. okay. But is there any indication that the Dursleys are Christian? No, there's not. You got to understand. You know, Rowling's writing this from a quote unquote English perspective. What percentage of the population of England is quote unquote Christian? Even Christian in name only. It's like less than 20%. So it's really low. Okay. And if you're a quote-unquote believing Christian, I mean, you actually say Jesus died, rose from the dead, that's down to like 5% of actual Brits who believe that. The rest from, you know, Jesus is just like Judah, Judah Buddha. Okay. Nice moral teacher. But you don't have to really go all serious about what he said. You know, don't go crazy in other words. We have no indication of what Harry's kind of religious thinking is, if it is. In fact, we're going to get indications in the next two books that Harry is your quintessential blank slate. He has no belief system. So that other people can write on that slate. Okay? So, he tells Dumbledore, I tried to check to see if Sirius was really there. I talked to Creature, Dumbledore, Creature lied. <laughs> Plain and simple. Okay. So, Harry says, don't you blame Sirius. I'm going to skip a little bit. Page 832. Don't you blame, don't you talk about Sirius like that. Creature is what he has been made by wizards, Harry. He is to be pitied. His existence has been as miserable as your friend Dobby's. He was forced to do Sirius's bidding. Why? Because Sirius was the last of the family to which he was enslaved, but he felt no true loyalty to him. 
Bottom of 833, Sirius did not hate creature. He regarded him as a servant unworthy of much interest or notice. Go back to the cave outside Hogsmeade. You want to take the measure of a man? See how he treats his inferiors. A servant unworthy of much interest or notice. Indifference and neglect often do much more damage than outright dislike. What does Dumbledore mean by that last sentence? And who is he really talking about? Is he talking about creature and the indifference and neglect he received at Sirius's hands? Or is he talking about Harry? The fountain we destroyed tonight told a lie. We wizards have mistreated and abused our fellows for too long. And now we are reaping our reward. What's he mean there? Are the goblins, the centaurs, the house elves, are they going to line up on the side of good against Voldemort? Yeah. Or are they going to try and be neutral? Are they going to try and stay out of it? We already know what side the giants are going to take. We already know what side the Dementors are going to take. Harry, so Sirius deserved what he got. Didn't say that. Sirius was not a cruel man. He was kind to house elves in general. He had no love for Creature. Why? Because Creature was a reminder of the thing that Sirius ran away from the Black House. Creature was a living reminder of the home Sirius had hated. And notice, where does Sirius have to live? in that home. Couldn't he go live with the Weasleys? Can you see Molly allowing that? <laughs> or Lupin? Harry, yeah, he did hate it. And you shut him up in there. I was trying to keep him alive. Yeah, people don't like being locked up. What's Harry talking about? 14 years with the Dursleys? You did it to me all last summer. And that's where Dumbledore finally takes his glasses off and says, time for me to tell you what I should have told you five years ago. Sit down. I ask only a little patience. And when I'm done, you can do whatever you like. I won't stop you. He says, I did what I did to keep you alive. Talks about Voldemort and stuff. Harry still, middle of 836. I don't understand. While you can still call home the place where your mother's blood dwells, there you cannot be touched or harmed by Voldemort. The place where your mother's blood dwells. Who's that? Petunia. And Dudley. I explained it all in a letter I left. She knows that allowing you house room may well have kept you alive. Harry, wait, ye howler. Yep. Page 837. Dumbledore explains, talks about his plan. He says there was a flaw in this plan of mine, an obvious flaw, that I knew even then. Harry, I don't understand. Why? Because Dumbledore's not zeroing in on the problem. What's he doing? He's talking around it. Don't you remember asking me as you lay in the hospital wing with Voldemort why Voldemort had tried to kill you when you were a baby? Notice. Harry nods. Why doesn't he speak? Why doesn't he say, yes, and you should have told me then? Because Harry realizes this is pretty important. And he's without words. All he can do is, uh-huh. In other words, he's going to get the answer to a question I think that's been plaguing him for five years. Should I have told you? Notice, Harry says nothing. He just stares. You don't see the flaw in the plan? Okay, so he explains. You came your first year, you defeated Voldemort again. We entered your second year, you defeated Voldemort again. Earlier Voldemort, but still. And I thought, you know, 12 years, still too young. You see yet, Harry? Bottom 838. You see the flaw in my plan? I'd fallen into the trap I had foreseen. I, I cared about you too much. What did Snake say about... <coughs> Fools who wear their heart on their sleeve. 
after a week. I cared more for your happiness than your knowing the truth. Notice. Happiness versus truth. More for your peace of mind than Dumbledore's plan. More for Harry Potter's life than the lives that might be lost if the plan failed. Well, whose lives were lost? Sirius. Who else? Cedric? Bertha Jorkins? Frank Bryce? Book six and book seven? <laughs> I acted exactly as Voldemort expects we fools who love to act. We fools who love. Puck is going to say, if you see a Midsummer Night's Dream this week, he's going to talk about mortals. Those fools who love. I think that's where she gets the line from. So Dumbledore says, is there a defense? I defy anyone who has watched you as I have. And I have watched you more closely than you could have imagined. Not to want to save you more pain than you'd already suffered. What did I care? If numbers of nameless and faceless people and creatures were slaughtered, if in the here and now you were alive and well and happy. Alive? Okay. Well and happy? Yeah. That's debatable, being raised by the Dursleys. He says, but third year came. What happened? You defeat a hundred Dementors. You rescue Sirius. Fourth year, you come out of the maze. Doing what? Carrying Cedric Diggory's body. And now? Voldemort tried to kill you when you were a child because of, because of a prophecy made shortly before your birth. Bottom of 839. He knew the prophecy had been made, though he did not know its full contents. He set out to kill you when you were still a baby, believing he was fulfilling the terms of the prophecy. He believed, to his cost, that he was mistaken. When he discovered, to his cost, he was mistaken, when the curse intended to kill you backfired. And so, since his return, and particularly since your extraordinary escape from him last year, he's been determined to hear that prophecy in its entirety. Sun had fully risen now. The sun is risen and its light is shining through the windows in Dumbledore's office. So they are bathed in gold. Why? What are the colors of Gryffindor? Red and gold. Harry, who, who heard the prophecy? I did. Cold, wet night 16 years ago. Okay. And he quotes the pro he pulls out the prophecy. The one with the power to vanquish the Dark Lord, page 841, approaches. Born to those who have thrice to fight him, born as the seventh month dies, and the Dark Lord will mark him as his equal, but he will have power the Dark Lord knows not. And either must die at the hand of the other, for neither can live while the other survives. The one with the power that... And it just goes on autoplay. Wouldn't that mean... Hermione would understand what it means, right? I mean, it's pretty clear English. It's not like it's written in gibberish. It meant that the person who has the only chance of conquering Lord Voldemort for good was born at the end of July, nearly 16 years ago. This boy would be born to parents uh, who had already defied Voldemort three times. Do we know about the three times James and Lily defied Voldemort? Nope. Uh, me? Funny thing is, old boy, May may not have been you, Dumbledore says. Another boy was born that same month, Neville Longbottom. Then why is my name on it, not Neville's? And here's the point that Harry takes until the end of book seven to get in his mind. Because Voldemort chose you. 
It seemed plain to the keeper of the Hall of Prophecy that Voldemort could only have tried to kill you because he knew you to be the one to whom Sybil was referring. Then it might not be me. No, it's you. But you said Neville. But you're forgetting the next part of the prophecy. Voldemort would mark him as his equal. And so, but he might have chosen wrong. So what does Harry mean, he might have chosen wrong? This might give us a little idea about Harry's religious beliefs, if he has them. What do we usually think prophecy means? Bingo. It's fate. It's destiny. It cannot be changed. Right? <clears throat> How is that different from this prophecy? It can be changed. How can it be changed? What would happen if this, with this prophecy if Voldemort just said to himself, again, because he hasn't heard the whole thing. If Voldemort had heard the whole prophecy, let me put it this way, what would he have done? Nothing. If I'm going to mark the one who will be my equal, well, wouldn't that be a pretty damn stupid thing to do? So I'm just not going to do it. Then I don't have an equal. Problem solved. But I think Rowling is thinking prophecy, Oedipus the king kind of prophecy, where in ancient Greek literature, a prophecy happens, a guy hears a prophecy, and he does everything in his power to keep that prophecy from happening. And in doing everything in his power to forestall it, he makes it happen. He might have marked the wrong person. What's Harry thinking? That in the grand scheme of things, there was this prophecy delivered from somewhere, and it indicated one specific person. And Harry's going, please, whatever power that is out there, let it have been Neville, <laughs> not me. He chose the boy he thought most likely to be a danger to him. Who did he choose? Half-blood. He didn't choose the pure blood. He chose one like himself. Okay. Harry, why? Why did he do it? Why did he try and kill me as a baby? He should have waited. Voldemort's information about the prophecy was incomplete. What part of the prophecy did he have? The first half. He had this part. The one with the power to vanquish the Dark Lord approaches, born to those who have thrice defied him, born as the seventh month dies. The Dark Lord, uh, he doesn't get the rest. He doesn't get the Dark Lord will mark him as an equal. He only gets the first two lines. Right? He only heard the first part. He did not know that you were that power the Dark Lord knows not. Harry, but I don't. I don't. I haven't any powers he hasn't got. I couldn't fight the way he did tonight. I can't possess people or kill them. He will have power the Dark Lord knows not. And Dumbledore says, Harry, there's a room in the Department of Mysteries kept locked at all times. What room is it? Love. Love. Simple old love. Harry, okay, the other part, the part at the end, something about neither can live. What's it say, actually? Either must die at the hand of the other, for neither can live while the other survives. So that means one of us has got to kill the other in the end? Yes. And then Dumbledore says, Oh, by the way, Harry, you probably should have been prefect, but I thought you had enough on your plate. Harry's probably thinking, really, now? You think I'm concerned about that? So, new beginning, second war begins. He who must not be named returns. End of year feast is happening. Harry skips it. And he goes upstairs and runs into nearly headless Nick. What does he want to ask Nick?
what happens when you die? I mean, Nick's dead, right? He's not mostly dead. He's all the way dead. Because he's packing, and he comes across the mirror that Sirius gave him at Christmas to do what? To communicate, which Harry doesn't think about after he has the vision. So he runs up to Nick. And Nick's like, really? Yeah, I knew this was coming. Page 860. It's just, um, you're dead, but you're here. That's right. I'm dead, and I'm here. So you came back, didn't you? People can come back, right? Ghosts, they don't have to disappear completely. Well, because Nick's, unlike his usual self, silent. <laughs> Not everyone can come back as a ghost. What do you mean? Only, only wizards. No, I, that's cool, because he's a wizard. He won't come back. Who? Sirius Black. But you did. You came back. You're dead and you didn't disappear. Wizards can leave an imprint of themselves upon the earth to walk palely where their living selves once trod. Few wizards choose that path. Why? I mean, serious will. He'll come back. I know he will. He will not come back. He will have dot, 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 gone on. What do you mean gone on? Gone on where? Listen, what happens when you die anyways? Where do you go? Why doesn't everyone come back? Why isn't this place full of ghosts? Why? It's like the floodgates have opened. For the first time in his life, Harry is starting to think about death. And yet death is the central fact of Harry's life. Right? It's the reason he lives with the Dursleys. Because of his parents' death. I can't answer. But you're dead, aren't you? I mean, if you can't tell anybody about death, who can? I was afraid of death. I chose to remain behind. I sometimes wonder whether I ought to have, well, that's neither here nor there. In fact, I'm neither here nor there. What's Harry's question getting at? What is there? <laughs> Where is there? What did Dumbledore say at the end of the first book? To the well-organized mind, death is but the next great adventure, Harry. Adventure where? Does the Hogwarts Express take you on somewhere else? I know nothing of the secrets of death, Harry. I chose my feeble imitation of life instead. I believe learned wizards study the matter in the Department of Mysteries. What's the death room in the Department of Mysteries? How is death portrayed in the Department of Mysteries? There's a veil. Think the Wizard of Oz. How's the wizard finally exposed? Toto goes and pulls the veil back. It's a metaphor. Okay? Sorry, couldn't be more help. He leaves the room, leaving Harry there alone, top of 862, gazing blankly at the wall through which Nick had disappeared. Harry felt almost as though he had lost his godfather all over again, in losing the hope that he might be able to see or speak to him once more. Notice, Harry is without what here? Hope. He sees Nick. There's a little flicker of hope. Well, maybe I can see. <laughs> he sees a little bit of hope that maybe he'll be able to talk to Sirius again. And what does Nick do to that hope? <laughs> Blows it completely to smithereens. He walks slowly and miserably back up through the empty castle, wondering whether he would ever feel cheerful again. This isn't the only time Harry's going to feel like this. He's going to experience the same feeling again in the next book and in the next book. Multiple times in book seven. He runs into Luna. How come Luna's not down at the feast? She's looking for her stuff. Why? She misplaced it. People hide it from her on the night before she has to leave, thinking it's funny. Oh, well, you know, they think 
bottom of age 62. I'm a bit odd, you know. Some people call me Looney Lovegood, actually. And Harry's like, <coughs> not me. No, I'd never do that, you know. Look, Harry looked at her, and the new feeling of pity intensified. Before he sees Luna, what is Harry feeling? Louder. Despair. Is despair felt for other people? No, it's all internal. Harry's whole focus, his whole attitude is focused on himself. Okay? Think back in um, Prisoner of Azkaban. Harry discovers about Sirius Black that he killed his parents, he thinks. And he's all angry at everything. He realizes Hagrid knows the truth. Harry's really angry at Hagrid. Why? Because he's feeling pity for himself. And he goes down to Hagrid's hut with Ron and Hermione. And what does he discover? What has Hagrid heard from the Committee for the Disposal of Dangerous Creatures? Buckbeak's going to die. What does that do? It turns Harry's focus from inward to outward. Right? Because what does he realize? He doesn't rationalize this. He doesn't understand it as a rational concept. But he realizes he cannot hate and love simultaneously. And love for Hagrid and Hagrid's pity overcomes his hate. Okay? Here, He's feeling a lot of, I'm going to use the term, self-pity. He sees Luna, and what does it do? It turns him outward. And he says, you want help finding your stuff? No, they'll come back. They always do in the end. It's just I wanted to pack. And then she mentions the man the Death Eaters killed. That was your godfather, wasn't he? Harry nods. And he remembers, she can see festivals. She saw somebody die. Have, have you ever, have you, anyone you know never died? Yes, my mother. She liked to experiment. One of her spells went quite, you know, badly wrong one day. Harry, I'm sorry. Yes, it was rather horrible. I still feel very sad about it sometimes. But I've still got dad. <coughs> and anyway, it's not as though I'll never see mom again, is it? Isn't it? Harry asks. Uncertainly. <laughs> Uncertainly means what? If you're not certain, then you have doubt. She shook her head in disbelief. Notice, uncertainly, doubt, disbelief. Disbelief at what? Does she have doubt that she'll see her mother? No. Her disbelief is in what? Harry's doubt. Oh, come on. You heard them. Just behind the veil. Didn't you? You mean yeah, in that room with the archway. They were just lurking out of sight. That's all. You heard them. Well, where else has Harry seen somebody lurking out of sight? He sees all these people. They're all smiling and waving. He reaches behind, and now one of them isn't smiling and waving. She's now crying and smiling. Why? Because inside the mirror, she realizes Harry sees her, and he's trying to reach her. But she is a place where Harry can't reach her physically. Are you sure you don't want me to help you look for your stuff? Oh, no. I think I'll just go down and have some pudding and... Wait for it all to turn up. Like her pajamas are going to march themselves up the hallway. Her books are going to float on their own. All what is Luna demonstrating for Harry here? Faith. She has faith the things will all turn up. Does she have knowledge that they will? No, with this one little proviso. They have every other year that people have taken them. Her experience is, they just turn up. 
Have a nice holiday. Yeah, you too. She walked away from him, and as, it, as he watched her go, he found that the terrible weight in his stomach seemed to have lessened slightly. Why? What has Luna introduced him to? What's the opposite of despair? Hope. A little bit of hope. A little bit of faith. Is it faith in Jesus? Is it faith in Buddha or Muhammad? Is it kind of organized religion faith? No. But it is faith what? Luna's faith is what? It'll work out in the end. It'll work out. In, what will work out? She'll get her stuff back. Does she know how? Nope. Does she care how? Nope. It's just that that's what will happen. Okay? Look at the beginning of this book. The other minister. Okay, this is the British edition, right? Which, I don't know how many, um, I forgot to look in the American one. The British edition is 607 pages. How much is the American? 652, right? So it's a little shorter page wise because there's more words on each page. Who's the other minister? Is the other minister the prime minister, or is the other minister the minister of magic? It's not quite clear, is it? Okay. And so what happens in this book? Uh, I've got to do this because I've got pagination is different. So, it's another page. Uh, so, so somewhere around page three or four. Fudge says, difficult to know where to begin. What a week. Bad one too, huh? Well, yeah, I've been having the same week you have, Prime Minister. What do you mean I've been having the same week you have? Remember the image that Harry had at the beginning of Order of the Phoenix? That he lived in two worlds that were separated by a chasm, and that somehow, when Petunia says, they guard the wizard for the past command, those two worlds join together. And it's as if there's not been any difference between them. Well, the other minister, are we talking like shadow minister? Or is this this image of the physical or material And the spiritual, or if you want, the wizarding, are joined together. And what happens in one affects what happens in the other. Um, fudge. I've been having the same week you have. Brockdale Bridge, Bones, Vance, Ver Murders, not to mention the ruckus in the West Country. Uh, your people were involved in those things? Well, of course they were. Surely you've realized what's going on. One thing you can kind of come to, I think, almost expect, is whenever somebody says, surely, in these books, no, it's not. <laughs> okay. <coughs> Notice, the prime minister hasn't put two and two together. He thinks what? Total separation between these two worlds. Okay. So we find out there's not. And uh, I'm going to skip a bunch. Scrimger comes in. I want to jump to chapter two, Spinner's End. What is Spinner's End, first of all? Why is it the title of the chapter? It's a neighborhood. It's the street Snape lives on, right? Okay. It's a street Snape lives on. Describe the street. Describe the neighborhood Snape lives in. It's not Bell Mead, right? Or Brentwood. 
It's run down. He, what occupies seemingly half of the street that Snape lives on? An old, run-down factory. Okay? I mean, look at the description. Um, many miles away, the chilly mist that had pressed against the Prime Minister's windows drifted over a dirty river that wound between overgrown, rubbish-strewn banks. An, an immense chimney, relic of a disused mill, reared up, shadowy and ominous. There was no sound apart from the whisper of the black water, black water, and no sign of life apart from a scrawny fox that had slunk down the bank to nose, hopefully, at some old fish and chip wrappings in the tall grass. So, a couple, couple people pop in. Who are they? Narcissa and Bellatrix. Okay. They make the way to Snape's street. And we're told, middle of the next page or so. He lives here, says Bellatrix. Here in this muggle dunghill. Skipping a little bit. But Narcissa had rushed ahead. Rubbing her hand, her pursuer followed again, keeping her distance now as they moved deeper into the deserted labyrinth of brick houses. At last, Narcissa hurried up a street called Spinner's Inn, over which the towering mill chimney seemed to hover like a giant admonitory finger. Her footsteps echoed on the cobbles as she passed boarded and broken windows until she reached the very last house where a dim light glimmered through the curtains in a downstairs room. Now this sounds like a home out of Dickens. 19th century industrial age, okay, run down. Why is it called Spinner's Inn? Oh, there's a factory, so it's probably where like the rumors and the spinners and uh, Okay, it's possible. You're getting close, I think. Okay. Two important words. Spinners and in. Let's do with this one first. What is the... What are a couple possible meanings for that word end? Stop. Stop. What else? Louder. Death. How do we usually... You know, use it. It comes after what? The beginning, beginning, middle, end. So it's the completion. What about when you talk about ends and means? Like the means to an end. What's the end there? Bingo, objective or purpose. Okay. The end of something, the end in that sense of this bottle is what? To hold liquid. That's the purpose for which the bottle was created. The end of this thing is to be able to do this, write on a whiteboard. Okay. So that's purpose. It could also be completion. I don't think it's stopped though, though he does live at the End, last house on the street, sounds like it is a, what we would call in America, I don't know why we call this because it's French, a cul-de-sac. That is, it ends like this. Okay? Spinners. Spins, weavers. Who else? Spiders. Spiders. What's being spun in this chapter? Lies. A tale. Promises. Deceit. 
What else? Louder. Connection. connection. What kind of connection? Okay, we talk. Spiders do what? Web. What's the web? Part of it. Those are threads. What do what, what is Narcissa asking Snake to do? How? The unbreakable vow. What does the unbreakable vow do? Okay. Connects, unites two people. For what purpose? Like marriage? Is the marriage an unbreakable vow? Interestingly, you read all the books, there's no account mentioned anywhere of a quote-unquote divorce. You have people who leave others, but not a divorce. And the one wedding that is referred to, the vow is referred to as unbreakable. Kind of interesting knowing Roland's own background, all right? Isn't Narcissa, excuse me, isn't Bellatrix, no, oh, take it back, Narcissa, trying to weave a web around Snape, trying to essentially trap him so that if her son gets trapped further in the center of the web, he will do what? He will rescue him how? What's the unbreakable vow? He will do the thing that, that Draco is tasked to do if Draco is unable to do. Okay? Jump to the end. What is the thing Draco is tasked to do? Kill Dumbledore. What does Snape do? Kill Dumbledore. What do we find out Snape has already done? Yeah, but we don't find that out in here. That comes later. Okay. So the spinners end. Okay. Who's actually doing the spinning? Is it Bellatrix or Narcissa? Is it Snape? It's Dumbledore. What's the end being talked about? It's Dumbledore's end. I mean. He referred Harry to what? His plan at the end of book five. Did he spell out all the details of that plan? Nope. When does he? Not till the end of book seven. I mean almost the very end of book seven. It's not until Harry goes back to King's Cross in book seven that he understands Fully, finally, the plan. And what's the plan? The plan is this, man. It, you talk about a web connecting all these loose, seemingly disparate events and people. One of the things Rowling is showing is the interconnectedness of everybody. In other words, what I do affects Mike, and it affects Brandy, and it affects Caitlin, and it affects Jordan, and all throughout. 19th century Russian writer, <coughs> Fyodor Dostoevsky, in his big, massive, long book, makes Rowling look like, you know, she's writing kindergarten tales. Um, the Brothers Karamazov has a character named Elder Zosima, and Zosima tells this story about his previous, kind of his previous life, life as a young man, and how he did some bad things, and now he's a, essentially a monk, right? He's a wise man. People come to him for advice and stuff. And he says in this one passage that what we do is like ripples in a pond. It affects everything. It affects the birds, affects the trees, affects the stars, and therefore, he says, people, okay, and this is, most people take, this is Dostoevsky, the Russian Orthodox, speaking through Zosima. 
that people should ask the birds for forgiveness. Which is, no. I don't quite necessarily get that. Why? Because of this ripple effect. Because we're all parts of threads of the same common web. So what's involved in the actual um, unbreakable vow? Well, let me back to this for a moment. The spinners, well, in Greek, or in Greece, you had the three fates. Who are these three? Clotho, Lachesis, and Atropo. Clotho, if I remember correctly, was the weaver of your thread of life. Right? Lachesis was the measurer. She was the one who said, you get six months, you get 18 months, you get 81 years, you get 112 years, you get 18 years. And Atropo, when Lachesis measured your span, Atropo was the one who came up and snipped. And that's when you died. Right? You also have, then in Scandinavia, the three Norns, okay, who have the exact same purpose as the three fates. Notice here we have three individuals plus Wormtail, but he doesn't really count because he's a rat, um, essentially. Okay, so what is Snape having to um, what's he having to repeatedly say? to Bellatrix, or proof in this chapter. That he's Voldemort's man. Why? What does she think? She thinks he turned and that he's... Okay. And, th and so what's he doing with Voldemort? Louder? Deceiving him. How does Snape turn that on Bellatrix? He said, oh, so you think I'm pulling a fast one on the Dark Lord? I have to tell him you think that about him the next time I see him. No, 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 that's not what I meant, you know. Notice how fearful she is of Snape relaying some of this information, Okay. Will and won't. Twenty-five minutes. Harry Potter, the chosen one. Question mark. Scrimger succeeds Fudge, Daily Prophet. Ministry guarantees student safety. Another headline. And then we have the purple leaflet. Emblazoned with the words, issued on behalf of the Ministry of Magic, protecting your home and family against dark forces. Now, most of you guys are too young to remember, but the, our government essentially did the same idiotic kind of thing after 911. They, they published pamphlets about how to protect yourself in the case of terrorist attack. You know, because the fear then was. A dirty bomb, a nuclear or radioactive bomb made out of nuclear or radioactive waste, such as you can get from hospitals and such, or other kinds of nuclear radioactive waste, or an actual nuclear, you know, suitcase bomb that could be detonated somewhere in the United States. And what was one of the things the government was suggesting we should do to protect ourselves? Cock the windows. Cock the windows. Put plastic sheeting up over your windows to keep all that deadly, you know, bad radiation out. It's freaking plastic. It's not going to stop radiation. It's like yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> well, I told you guys before, I grew up uh, less than 20 miles from Moffett Airfield in California, which is now owned, or it's not owned, it's leased by Google for like the next millennium. Um, but out of Moffat Airfield, the largest hangar 
airplane hangar in the, in the world, because um, Zeppelins used to be used in and out of it, U-2 spy planes would take off and land. I'd be out backyard playing, and you'd always know when a U-2 was coming in, because they screamed, even at 50,000 feet. I mean, it sounded like a jet engine on the street next to me when those suckers would, would come in. And it was, yeah, duck and cover, because, you know, if somebody drops a 50 megaton nuke on Lockheed Martin 15 miles away, psst, that'd be it, okay? So what do you advise? Don't leave the house alone. Care should be taken during the hours of darkness. Complete journeys before night, you know, all that kind of nonsense. So here he has a letter from Dumbledore saying he's going to come pick him up. Dumbledore arrives. This is around page 45 or so. He's standing there on the doormat. Vernon's standing in the open doorway. And Dumbledore sees Harry behind Vernon. Oh, good evening. Excellent, excellent. These words seemed to rouse Uncle Vernon. It was clear that as far as he was concerned, any man who could look at Harry and say excellent was a man with whom he could never see eye to eye. I don't mean to be rude, Vernon says. Yet, sadly, accidental rudeness occurs alarmingly often, Dumbledore finishes Vernon's statement. And he walks in. Okay. Dumbledore looks at Petunia. And Vernon says, we've corresponded, of course. Really? Has Vernon been secretly writing letters to Dumbledore? No. How have they corresponded? Dumbledore left a letter with Harry 16 years ago. And he delivered a howler. Okay? So, will and won't refers to what? What must Harry do in this chapter? to prove that he is legally Sirius's heir. He's got to give Creature an order, and Creature has to obey. If he doesn't obey, then he knows there's a problem with that. Okay? By the way, they just now find out that Sirius is dead. They, the Dursleys. So, while Dumbledore is sitting there, he's kind of drawn up drinks for them, move the couch so that the Dursleys are all sitting. And da, 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 he gets Creature. There he gives the command to Creature. Creature disappears. So pick up with around 50, 51 or 52. Dumbledore says... As you will no doubt be aware, Harry comes of age in a year's time. Petunia, no. Dumbledore, uh, sorry. <laughs> no, he doesn't. He's a month younger than Dudley. Dudders doesn't turn 18 until the year after next. Dumbledore, yeah, but in the wizarding world, we turn adult at 17. He goes on. He talks about Voldemort returning. And he says... Harry, whom Lord Voldemort has already attempted to kill on a number of occasions, is in even greater danger now than the day when I left him upon your doorstep 15 years ago. With their letter explaining about his parents' murder and expressing the hope that you would care for him as though he were your own. He pauses. Why? <coughs> yeah, very dramatic effect. He's going to let that sit in for a little bit. I hoped you would treat him as your own. You did not do as I had. You have never treated Harry as a son. He has known nothing but neglect and often cruelty at your hands. Where's, where have we seen the cruelty? I mean, the neglect we've seen. What about the cruelty? Did they starve him? Okay, some of the stuff in the pins have with Snape. How about Ripper? Chasing him up the tree, and they're laughing. Okay, is Dudley getting Christmas presents and Harry not getting any cruelty? 
Well, I guess maybe to a five-year-old, yeah, that yeah, could be pretty cruel. But that's not physical cruelty. Dudley beating on Harry, that's physical cruelty. Do we ever hear of an instance where Vernon actually physically touches Harry? Punches him, smacks him, whatever. No. Are there threats of it? Yes. All right. Yes, he's often hungry. He's made to wear Dudley's too big clothes. The best that can be said is that he has at least escaped the appalling damage you have inflicted upon the unfortunate boy sitting between you. And there's Dudley. And Petunian, Vernon, you know, look at Dudley. Dudley's like, what? What appalling damage. Us mistreat debtors? What do you... The magic I evoked 15 years ago means that Harry has powerful protection while they can still call this house home. However miserable he has been here, however unwelcome, however badly treated, you have at least grudgingly allowed him house room. In other words, he's been like a renter. <laughs> this magic will cease to operate the moment Harry turns 17. In other words, the moment he becomes a man. All I ask, allow Harry to come home once more to this house before his 17th birthday. Notice, he doesn't have to come home Christmas holidays. He doesn't have to come home Easter holidays, but you need to let him come home next summer. None of the Dursleys said anything. Why? Because they're still trying to figure out how they mistreated Dudley. But Petunia is oddly flushed. Well, how did they mistreat Dudley? They gave him everything he wanted. But how's that mistreating him? I mean, I thought you're supposed to give your child everything the child wants. He has no character. He has no character. And yet, between this book and book seven, something happens to Dudley. Not a lot. He doesn't, really, you know, develop into Mahatma Gandhi or something, where he's got this great, you know, moral character, but something happens. Why is Aunt Petunia oddly flushed? She's embarrassed. She's embarrassed. What's another form of embarrassment? She's ashamed. Dumbledore got through. So, time to leave. They go off to Horace Slughorns, okay, which I'm going to skip a bunch of. We've already seen, we didn't talk about it, but in the first chapter, who's been murdered? Amelia Susan Bones, who was what in book five? Head of the War Department, Magical Law Enforcement. Okay. And Emily Vance, and she was what? One of the Order of the Phoenix. Okay. How did they die? Nobody knows. Well, nobody in our world knows. It's pretty clear they were Avada Kedavra. Okay. Harry says in this chapter, page numbers, somewhere around 74. <laughs> he's talking about how hard it is realizing he'll never get a letter from Sirius again and such and Dumbledore says Sirius represented much to you that you had never known before Harry but while I was at the Dursleys I realized I can't shut myself away or, or crack up Sirius wouldn't have wanted that would he anyway life's too short look at Madame Bone look at Emily Vance could be me Nick couldn't it so he says, but if it is, he said fiercely, now looking straight into Dumbledore's blue eyes, gleaming in the one light, I'll make sure I take as many Death Eaters with me as I can, and Voldemort too if I can manage it. How does Dumbledore reply? 
spoken both like your mother and father's son, and Sirius is true God's son. What does Harry mean? I'll take as many as I can. Go down, guns blazing, right? And yet, jump to book seven. Sorry for those of you who haven't read it. How many does Harry take down? How many does Harry kill? None. Why not? Because he's a lover, not a fighter. No. Well, take that back. Yes. <laughs> he's not a killer. Okay? So why does Dumbledore say, Way to go, Harry. That's what James would have wanted you to say. And Sirius and your mom. Yeah, kill them all, those rotten bastards. You know, pull out your wand, turn it into an AK, and go, <laughs> you know. So, Dumbledore asked Harry, have you told your friends about the prophecy? No. Wise decision. Although I think you ought to relax it in favor of your friends, Mr. Ronald Weasley and Ms. Hermione Granger. He says they ought to know. You do them a disservice by not confiding something this important to them. I didn't want to worry or frighten them, or perhaps to confess that you yourself are worried and frightened. You need your friends, Harry. How much does Harry need his friends? Oh, I don't know. Let's go back to book one. <laughs> Through the trap door. Without Hermione, he wouldn't have gotten through the trap door. Because she's the one who noticed there was a trap door to begin with. So he'd be dead right there. Devil's snare, dead again. Uh, chest, dead again. Potions, dead again. Quirrell took care of the troll, but probably dead again if he had it, you know. In other words, without his friends, Harry's not much, okay? And, you know, we could do the same thing through the other books. What else is Dumbledore saying there? Spread the burden. Spread the burden. You don't have to do it all on your own, Harry. What did he, or should he have discovered, from the previous book? After all, he did create the DA, Dumbledore's army. He has what? Okay, he shows leadership, but he has others who will fight alongside him. Jump to the end of book seven. What? What opportunity does Voldemort give Harry towards the end of book seven? And the other, and the rest of the wizarding community. Let me point that out to you. You know, he gets on his magical PA system, says we'll take a little break here, like he's channeling Ludo Bagman, you know. We'll take a little break here. You can gather all your dead and wounded, those who have fought valiantly, you know, but they're still dead and wounded. And he says what? You've got one hour to do what? Deliver me, Harry Potter. And if you don't, and then he speaks directly to Harry. Everybody else who dies will die for what? For you, Harry. They will die instead of you. They will become what? Martyrs. Or they'll be sacrificing themselves. All right? You need your friends, Harry. So, they keep talking, and Dumbledore says, um, I'm going to give you private lessons this year. And Harry's thinking, yes, score, you know. I think it's time I took a greater hand in your education. What are you going to be teaching me? Yeah, a little bit of this, a little bit of that. He says, so I won't have optimistic lessons with Snape? Professor Snape, Harry. Good, because they were Dumbledore. Fiasco? I think that's the right word. All right, chapter 5. Excess of phlegm. That's actually on the same page. Um, so we see Bill and Fleur and Gagged. Uh, let's see. 
Harry gets his owls, page 102. And we finally get, you know, the grades for owls. O, outstanding, E, exceeds expectations, A, acceptable, failing grades, poor, dreadful, and troll level. Astronomy, he gets an A. Why? Because he cheats from Hermione. Care of magical creatures, he gets an E, exceeds expectations. Why? Because it's angry. Charms, he gets an E, Flitwick. Defense against the dark arts, notice, outstanding. Why? Well, probably that little bit about the DA, you know, didn't hurt. Divination, poor. Why? Louder? Wanted to give it up. Why else? How long did he take divination with Tarani? Previous year. In the previous year. Not very because, for, well, a few months because then friends took over. Okay? Notice, by the way, I don't think I've talked about this. What kinds of magic are practiced and or taught at Hogwarts? I mean, give me some names, classes and such. Okay, transfiguration, herbology, potions, defense against the dark arts, charms, arithmancy, you know, the magic of numbers. Numerology, essentially. Astrology. Is it astrology? astrology? It's astronomy, actually. Okay, which is kind of odd. Astrology. Astrology was what? Um, it's kind of a branch of divination. Okay. Yeah, I mean, Ferenc was teaching about the stars, but he wasn't teaching astronomy where you go up to the top of the astronomy tower teaching in astronomy. What does um, Trelawney teach? Okay. Which involves what? What does Harry have to do? First lesson. You have tea leaves. What else? Crystal ball. Palm readings. Dream interpretation, you know, Jungian and Freudian and such. Okay. Of all these kinds of magic that we see, I mean, just look at these classes. Astronomy, care of magical creatures, charms, defense against dark arts, divination, herbology, history of magic, potions, transfiguration. Which of those are practiced in our real world? Astronomy and... Can you go find a historian of magic in our world? Divination. Divination. You can go a couple of different places in Murfreesboro. You can get your palm red. You can get your tea leaves red. You can get tarot cards red. You can get your horoscope red. That's all part of divination. And of all the teachers at Hogwarts, which one's the quack? Complete and utter fraud. It's this one. It's the only quote unquote real world branch of magic because we don't consider astronomy to be magic. This is considered to be magic of sorts. And Rowling does what with it? She shows it's nonsense. And yet, people come out of the woodwork and say, oh, she's preaching magic, leading children. What's the real magic in the books? It doesn't have anything, to use Snape's term, to do with silly wand waving. What is it? Love. Love? What else? Love is an aspect of what? It is a virtue. Love, you need your Harry, friendship, loyalty, louder, family, family justice, <laughs> fair play, think of Hufflepuff, hard work, 
Okay, industriousness, ambition, if not taken to the wrong degree, or if ambition is not placed in front of, you know, everything else. So, what kind of grades has Harry earned here the previous year? Pretty good, when you look at them in their entirety. Only two that are not very good. History of magic. How many of you have had professors in MTSU, and you could, you know, me too maybe, but how many of you have had professors in MTSU that it's almost impossible not to fall asleep in their class because monotone, it's like, and they don't vary pitch at all. They don't move around. It's just turn on the recorder. I mean, I walk by some of my colleagues' class, and I'm thinking, my God, I've changed something. Wear a dress. Wear, if you're a man, you know, do something to get their interest. Because I've seen, you know, I just kind of glazed over like they're all under an imperialist cruise. Anyways, <laughs> let's stop there. We'll pick up with um, chapter six, Draco's Detour. If we have a quiz, it'll be over about the first half of the book.